last watch before the weekend? Obviously, 
looks cool, right? And that's why we build airplanes, because they look cool. Yeah, probably not. So design requirements, right? Every airplane has a specific criteria and limitations that they want met. So who comes up with those design requirements? Well, for the variable sweep wings, it was the military, and in specific, the US Navy. They had a bunch of criteria, and they came to the manufacturers and said, hey, we want an airplane that can, one, go supersonic, okay? Two, can land on an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. Then, we want something that can drop a certain tonnage of bombs. And most importantly, they wanted something that was going to be common across services because of the fact that there was a bunch of crunch. They wanted an airplane that could fly for the Navy and the Air Force so it would be cheaper to train their pilots standardization, just like we do here. And um, parts commonality, so cheaper maintenance. So what did we come up with? Came up with the F-111. And the F-111 was actually the first production variable sweep aircraft ever. Uh, it was mass produced. So, of course, this was during the Cold War, and Russia was trying to follow what we were doing, and we were kind of following what they were doing. So they saw that we had a variable sweep, sweep wing aircraft that was a bomber, so they figured they better build one that was a fighter so they could come up and get us if we ever did decide to build a bomb one. So, typical Russian fashion, they didn't start from the ground up like we did on the F-111. They actually took a current aircraft that they already had, the Su-7, chopped the wingtips off, put pivots on them, and made it swing. So, their first swing aircraft was the Su-17. So, before we get into any more on uh, swing wing, let's just go over uh, a few things on wing design for various phases of flight. So, short landing distance, what kind of a wing do we want? For short landing distance, what, what are we looking for? Yellow. Like a What's that? Like a Piper Cub. Okay, what does Piper Cub have? Did you say, okay, straight? Did you say maybe thick? Thick wing, maybe? Okay. Increased aspect ratio? Yeah, it's starting to come back now, okay. Long wing span and cord, okay? The more wing we have, the more lift we're gonna get out of it. The thicker it is, the more lift we're gonna get out of it. Plus, that also helps us because we can mount stuff on it, right? Like flaps and slats. Cool. So, that's all that we want for low speed flight. How about now, high speed? And thin. Thin, good. Low aspect ratio, high speed back. So basically everything that we didn't want in the low speed one, we want in the high speed one, right? So what does high speed, or I'm sorry, high sweep back give us? There you go, the laser have crit. Why is that important? Okay. Not quite. Okay, so we're delaying them crit, right? We're delaying those shock waves that are going to create a lot of drag. Okay, so we can stay subsonic for longer, conserve energy, but go faster. Right? So then once we're inside the Mach cone, now we're going supersonic, we're still getting subsonic air over the wings because, remember with those oblique shock waves, anything behind them is subsonic air, and that's what we're getting over the wings. So, what does the variable sweep configuration do for us? Well, it gives us the best of both worlds, right? So we unsweep the wings, low handling, or I'm sorry, good handling characteristics at low speed, good landing characteristics, but then we can sweep them back and we can go Mach 2. So, big military applications in that type of a design. So, move into early wing designs. So, what did they look like initially? Well, the first ever scenario where somebody tried to solve this problem of being able to be slow to take off and land and then change the aircraft in flight to go fast was, again, the Russians. And they created the Nikitin Shevchenko IS. Started out as a biplane and what they did is they actually, when they took off, they needed that extra wing at the time for the lift, and then they got off the ground, they pulled the wing up into the top wing, which folded the landing gear into the aircraft, so they turned the biplane into a monoplane in flight, and went faster. So, built in the 1930s, interrupted in World War II, uh, they really didn't continue it after that because it was just too complex of a design and they figured out how to go faster anyway. But this is what it actually looked like. So you see this is the uh, landing gear here, then it starts coming up, the wing folds up, gear folds into the airplane, and looks like that in flight. So, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, next one is the actually the uh, first aircraft to be able to change the wing sweep. Now, that's important because they couldn't do it in flight. So the Messerschmitt MEP 1101, uh, they can only change the wing sweep on the ground. So 
say that you had an loiter ground attack mission sweeping forward more lift, more uh, flight time if you had a high speed interception mission that sweep them back. This aircraft never actually went into production. They had the Allies found it parts, took it back to the United States, and actually created the Bell X-5, which, take a look at it, I'm gonna show you a YouTube clip here soon, and it almost looks exactly the same. It's really the same aircraft. But the Bell X-5 now was the first aircraft to be able to vary the sweep of its wings in flight. So, but what happened when they started doing that? Well, initially they just put a center pivot in the aircraft and just swung the wings. Well, that didn't work out very well because as you sweep the wings back, the center of pressure and the wing moves back as well. Well, as the center of pressure moves back, our pitch attitude, or our, actually our nose wants to drop. So there's a whole slew of controllability issues with that. So it was hard to control until they fixed it with a fairly complex solution for the time, which was called wing translation. What wing translation means is, as we sweep the wings back, the wing roots move forward to compensate for that change in the center of pressure. So, we'll go ahead and take a look here at the Bell X-5. And this is actually the P-1101 right here. No, that's the Bell X-5. And it's going to sweep the wings. I'm going to put my mouse pointer up here so you guys can actually see how far those wing roots do move forward. And here it is on its flight, and it again will change the wing sweep in flight uh, from fully unswept to fully swept. And as you can see, it's kind of hard to notice it in this one, but as they sweep the wings back, they do have to increase their angle of attack because they're staying at the same airspeed. So less wing area, less lift, they need more angle of attack to keep your altitude. So, So what did we find out from this experimentation? Well, we found out that wing translation, it works, but it's really not feasible. We're not going to build it into a complex aircraft because it's maintenance intensive, there's a lot of moving parts, and it can go really crappy in a real hurry, and you don't want that in a combat airplane. But what else did we find out? Wing rotation is feasible. It's not the way they were doing it. We can't put a center pivot in the aircraft and just swing the wings from the center of the fuselage. That one's just isn't going to work. So there was a simple solution to it, and if you look closely at the bird picture at the beginning, it looks a lot like that. So now we get into evolution of the aerodynamics of the swing wing. So we did solve that problem. How did we do that? Well, came up with a new design. That design was designed by no one other than the British. And that was in 1958. They decided to fix the wing roots to the aircraft and then only swing the wing tips. So that uh, was noted by the US. And in 1960, we came out with a patent uh, by W.J. Elford Jr. Uh, in association with NASA. And they basically had the same idea. And I'll show you a picture of the uh, conceptual drawing here in a second. So what they did is they created the two-part wing. The inboard, which was fixed to the aircraft, it was thick, so high lift area. Um, then we put the outboard section, which was thin and movable, but still thick enough that we could actually hinge flaps and slats to it, um, because that didn't really matter once we swung back into the aircraft. So here's a picture of an F-14. This is the inboard section of the wing. This is the fixed area. So you can see the thickness difference between here and the outboard section of the wing. So we're going to get more lift from this area, but it is swept to the farthest sweep back that the wing can go, so we don't really have to worry about problems of high-speed flight. And the outboard section here, that will have the flaps and slats mounted to it, that swings back. So, what do we find out? Only the outboard section of the wing moves, which doesn't quite